Hello, and welcome to Book Spot. I'm Earl Weyenberg. This time we're going to continue our reading of Alice in Wonderland by Lewis Carroll. Alice has been going through her adventures, changing size as she goes, and she's now about three inches tall, and battling her way through the weeds, has found a mushroom with a caterpillar on it. Chapter 5, Advice from a Caterpillar. The caterpillar and Alice looked at each other for some time in silence. At last, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and addressed her in a languid, sleepy voice. Who are you? said the caterpillar. This was not an encouraging opening for a conversation. Alice replied rather shyly, I, I hardly know, sir, just at present. At least, I know who I was when I got up this morning, but I think I must have been changed several times since then. What do you mean by that? said the caterpillar sternly. Explain yourself. I can't explain myself, sir. I'm afraid because I'm not myself, you see, said Alice. I don't see, said the caterpillar. I'm afraid I can't put it more clearly, Alice replied very politely, for I can't understand it myself to begin with, and being so many different sizes in a day is very confusing. It isn't, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps you haven't found it so yet, said Alice, but when you have to turn into a chrysalis, you will some day, you know, and then after that into a butterfly, I should think you'll feel it a little queer, won't you? Not a bit, said the caterpillar. Well, perhaps your feelings may be different, said Alice. All I know is it would feel very queer to me. You, said the caterpillar contemptuously, who are you? Which brought them back again to the beginning of the conversation. Alice felt a little irritated at the caterpillar, making such very short remarks, and she drew herself up and said very gravely, I think you ought to tell me who you are first. Why? said the caterpillar. Here was another puzzling question, and as Alice could not think of any good reason, and as the caterpillar seemed to be in a very unpleasant state of mind, she turned away. Come back, the caterpillar called after her. I've something important to say. This sounded promising, certainly. Alice turned and came back again. Keep your temper, said the caterpillar. Is that all? said Alice, swallowing down her anger as well as she could. No, said the caterpillar. Alice thought she might as well wait, as she had nothing else to do, and perhaps after all it might tell her something worth hearing. For some minutes it puffed away without speaking, but at last it unfolded its arms, took the hookah out of its mouth again, and said, So you think you're changed, do you? I'm afraid I am, sir, said Alice. I can't remember things as I used, and I don't keep the same size for ten minutes together. Can't remember what things, said the caterpillar. Well, I've tried to say, how doth the little busy bee, but it all came different, Alice replied in a very melancholy voice. Repeat, you are old Father William, said the caterpillar. Alice folded her hands and began. You are old, Father William, the young man said, and your hair has become very white, and yet you incessantly stand on your head. Do you think at your age it is right? In my youth, Father William replied to his son, I feared it might injure the brain, but now that I am perfectly sure I have none, why, I do it again and again. You are old, said the youth, as I mentioned before, and have grown most uncommonly fat, yet you turned a back somersault in at the door, Pray, what is the reason of that? In my youth, said the sage, as he shook his gray locks, I kept all my limbs very supple. By the use of this ointment, one shilling the box, allow me to sell you a couple. You are old, said the youth, and your jaws are too weak for anything tougher than suet. Yet you finished the goose with the bones and the beak. Pray, how did you manage to do it? In my youth, said his father, I took to the law, and argued each case with my wife and the muscular strength which it gave to my jaw has lasted the rest of my life. You are old, said the youth. One would hardly suppose that your eye was as steady as ever, yet you balanced an eel on the end of your nose. What made you so awfully clever? 
I have answered three questions, and that is enough, said his father. Don't give yourself airs. Do you think I can listen all day to such stuff? Be off, or I'll kick you downstairs. That is not said right, said the caterpillar. Not quite right, I'm afraid, said Alice timidly. Some of the words have got altered. It is wrong from beginning to end, said the caterpillar decidedly, and there was silence for some minutes. The caterpillar was the first to speak. What size do you want to be? it asked. Oh, I'm not particular as to size, Alice hastily replied. Only one doesn't like changing so often, you know. I don't know, said the caterpillar. Alice said nothing. She had never been so much contradicted in all her life before, and she felt she was losing her temper. Are you content now, said the caterpillar. Well, I should like to be a little larger, sir, if you wouldn't mind, said Alice. Three inches is such a wretched height to be. It's a very good height indeed, said the caterpillar angrily, rearing itself upright as it spoke. It was exactly three inches high. But I'm not used to it, pleaded poor Alice in a piteous tone, and she thought to herself, I wish the creatures wouldn't be so easily offended. You'll get used to it in time, said the caterpillar, and it put the hookah into its mouth and began smoking again. This time Alice waited patiently until it chose to speak again. In a minute or two, the caterpillar took the hookah out of its mouth and yawned once or twice and shook itself. Then it got down off the mushroom and crawled away into the grass, merely remarking as it went, One side will make you grow taller, and the other side will make you grow shorter. One side of what? The other side of what? thought Alice to herself. Of the mushroom, said the caterpillar, just as if she had asked it aloud and in another moment it was out of sight. Alice remained looking thoughtfully at the mushroom for a minute, trying to make out which were the two sides of it, and as it was perfectly round, she found this a very difficult question. However, at last she stretched her arms round it as far as they would go and broke off a bit of the edge with each hand. And now which is which, she said to herself, and nibbled a little of the right hand bit to try the effect. The next moment she felt a violent blow underneath her chin. It had struck her foot. She was a good deal frightened by this very sudden change, but she felt there was no time to be lost as she was shrinking rapidly. So she set to work at once to eat some of the other bit. Her chin was pressed so closely against her foot there was hardly room to open her mouth. But she did it at last and managed to swallow a morsel of the left-hand bit. Come, my head's free at last, said Alice in a tone of delight, which changed into alarm in another moment, when she found that her shoulders were nowhere to be found. All she could see when she looked down was an immense length of neck, which seemed to rise like a stalk out of a sea of green leaves that lay far below her. What can all that green stuff be, said Alice, and where have my shoulders got to? And oh, my poor hands, how is it I can't see you? She was moving them about as she spoke, but no result seemed to follow except a little shaking among the distant green leaves. As there seemed to be no chance of getting her hands up to her head, she tried to get her head down to them, and was delighted to find that her neck would bend about easily in any direction like a serpent. She had just succeeded in curving it down into a graceful zigzag, and was going to dive in among the leaves, which she found to be nothing but the tops of the trees under which she had been wandering, when a sharp hiss made her draw back in a hurry. A large pigeon had flown into her face and was beating her violently with its wings. Serpent! screamed the pigeon. I'm not a serpent, said Alice indignantly. Leave me alone. Serpent, I say again, repeated the pigeon, but in a more subdued tone, and added with a kind of sob, I've tried every way and nothing seems to suit them. I haven't the least idea what you're talking about, said Alice. I've tried the roots of trees, and I've tried banks, and I've tried hedges, the pigeon went on without attending to her, but those serpents, there's no pleasing them. Alice was more and more puzzled, but she thought there was no use in saying anything more till the pigeon had finished. As if it wasn't trouble enough hatching the eggs, said the pigeon, but I must be on the lookout for serpents day and night. Why, I haven't had a wink of sleep these three weeks. I'm very sorry you've been annoyed, said Alice, who was beginning to see its meaning. 
and just as I'd taken the highest tree in the wood, continued the pigeon, raising its voice to a shriek, and just as I was thinking I should be free of them at last, they must needs come wriggling down from the sky. Ah, oh, serpent! But I'm not a serpent, I tell you, said Alice. I'm a... I'm a... Well, what are you, said the pigeon. I can see you're trying to invent something. I... I'm a little girl said Alice, rather doubtfully, as she remembered the number of changes she had gone through that day. A likely story indeed, said the pigeon, in a tone of the deepest contempt. I've seen a good many little girls in my time, but never one with such a neck as that. No, no, you're a serpent, and there's no use denying it. I suppose you'll be telling me next you never tasted an egg. I have tasted eggs, certainly, said Alice, who was a very truthful child. But little girls eat eggs quite as much as serpents do, you know. I don't believe it, said the pigeon. But if they do, why, then they're a kind of serpent. That's all I can say. This was such a new idea to Alice that she was quite silent for a minute or two, which gave the pigeon the opportunity of adding, You're looking for eggs. I know that well enough. And what does it matter to me whether you're a little girl or a serpent? It matters a good deal to me, said Alice hastily. But I'm not looking for eggs, as it happens, and if I was, I shouldn't want yours. I don't like them raw. Well, be off then, said the pigeon in a sulky tone, as it settled down again into its nest. Alice crouched down among the trees as well as she could, for her neck kept getting entangled among the branches, and every now and then she had to stop and untwist it. After a while, she remembered that she still held the pieces of mushroom in her hands, and she set to work very carefully, nibbling first at one and then at the other, and growing sometimes taller and sometimes shorter, until she had succeeded in bringing herself down to her usual height. It was so long since she had been anything near the right size that it felt quite strange at first, but she got used to it in a few minutes and began talking to herself as usual. Come, there's half my plan done now. How puzzling all these changes are! I'm never sure what I'm going to be from one minute to another. However, I've got right back to my right size. The next thing is to get into that beautiful garden. How is that to be done, I wonder? As she said this, she came suddenly upon an open place with a little house in it about four feet high. Whoever lives there, thought Alice, it'll never do to come upon them at this size. Why well, should frighten them out of their wits? So she began nibbling at the right-hand bit again, and did not venture to go near the house till she had brought herself down to nine inches high. Chapter 6 Pig and Pepper For a minute or two she stood looking at the house and wondering what to do next, when suddenly a footman in livery came running out of the wood. She considered him to be a footman because he was in livery, Otherwise, judging by his face only, she would have called him a fish, and rapped loudly at the door with his knuckles. It was opened by another footman in livery, with a round face and large eyes like a frog. And both footmen, Alice noticed, had powdered hair that curled all over their heads. She felt very curious to know what it was all about, and crept a little way out of the wood to listen. The fish footman began to by producing from under his arm a great letter nearly as large as himself, and this he handed over to the other, saying in a solemn tone, For the Duchess, an invitation from the Queen to play croquet. The frog footman repeated in the same solemn tones, only changing the order of the words a little, From the Queen, an invitation from the Duchess to play croquet. Then they both bowed low and their curls got entangled together. Alice laughed so much at this that she had to run back into the wood for fear of their hearing her, and when she next peeped out, the fish footman was gone and the other was sitting on the ground near the door, staring stupidly up at the sky. Alice went timidly up to the door and knocked. There's no sort of use in knocking, said the footman, and that for two reasons. First, because I'm on the same side of the door as you are, Secondly, because they're making such a noise inside, no one could possibly hear you. And certainly there was a most extraordinary noise going on within, a constant howling and sneezing, and every now and then a great crash, as if a dish or kettle had been broken to pieces. Please then, said Alice, how am I to get in? There might be some sense in your knocking, the footman went on without attending to her, 
if we had the door between us. For instance, if you were inside, you might knock and I could let you out, you know. He was looking up into the sky all the time he was speaking, and this Alice thought decidedly uncivil. But perhaps he can't help it, she said to herself. His eyes are so very nearly at the top of his head. But at any rate, he might answer questions. How am I to get in, she repeated aloud. I shall sit here, the footman remarked, till tomorrow. At this moment, the door of the house opened, and a large plate came skimming out straight at the footman's head. It just grazed his nose and broke to pieces against one of the trees behind him. Or the next day, maybe, the footman continued in the same tone, exactly as if nothing had happened. How am I to get in? asked Alice again in a louder tone. Are you to get in at all? said the footman. That's the first question, you know. It was, no doubt, only Alice did not like to be told so. It's really dreadful, she muttered to herself, the way all the creatures argue. It's enough to drive one crazy. The footman seemed to think this a good opportunity of repeating his remark with variations. I shall sit here, he said, on and off for days and days. But what am I to do? asked Alice. Anything you like, said the footman, and began whistling. Oh, there's no use in talking to him, said Alice desperately. He's perfectly idiotic. And she opened the door and went in. The door led right into a large kitchen, which was full of smoke from one end to the other. The Duchess was sitting on a three-legged stool in the middle, nursing a baby. The cook was leaning over the fire, stirring a large cauldron, which seemed to be full of soup. There's certainly too much pepper in that soup, said Alice to herself, as well as she could, for sneezing. There was certainly too much of it in the air. Even the Duchess sneezed occasionally, and as for the baby, it was sneezing and howling alternately without a moment's pause. The only two creatures in the kitchen that did not sneeze were the cook and a large cat which was sitting on the hearth and grinning from ear to ear. Please, would you tell me, said Alice a little timidly, for she did not, was not quite sure whether it was good manners for her to speak first, why your cat grins like that? It's a Cheshire cat, said the Duchess, and that's why. Pig! She said the last word with such sudden violence that Alice quite jumped, but she saw in another moment that it was addressed to the baby, and not to her. So she took courage and went on again. I didn't know that Cheshire cats always grinned. In fact, I didn't know that cats could grin. They all can, said the Duchess, and most of them do. I don't know of any that do, said Alice very politely, feeling quite pleased to have got into a conversation. You don't know much, said the Duchess, and that's a fact. Alice did not at all like the tone of this remark and thought it would be as well to introduce some other subject of conversation. While she was trying to fix on one, the cook took the cauldron of soup off the fire and at once set to work throwing everything within her reach at the Duchess and the baby. The fire irons came first, then followed a shower of saucepans, plates, and dishes. The Duchess took no notice of them even when they hit her, and the baby was howling so much already that it was quite impossible to say whether the blows hurt it or not. Oh, please mind what you're doing, cried Alice, jumping up and down in an agony of terror. Oh, there goes his precious nose, as an unusually large saucepan flew close by it and very nearly carried it off. Everybody minded their own business, said the Duchess in a hoarse growl. The world would go round a deal faster than it does. Which would not be an advantage, said Alice, who felt very glad to get an opportunity of showing off a little of her knowledge. Just think what work it would make with the day and night. You see, it takes the earth 24 hours to turn round on its axis. Talking of axes, said the Duchess, chop off her head. Alice glanced rather anxiously at the cook to see if she meant to take the hint. But the cook was busily stirring the soup and seemed not to be listening. So she went on again, 24 hours, I think, or is it 12? I, oh, don't bother me, said the Duchess. I never could abide figures. And with that, she began nursing her child again, singing a sort of lullaby to it as she did, and giving it a violent shake at the end of every line. Speak roughly to your little boy and beat him when he sneezes. He only does it to annoy because he knows it teases. Chorus, in which the cook and baby joined, wow, wow, wow. 
While the Duchess sang the second verse of the song, she kept tossing the baby violently up and down, and the poor little thing howled so that Alice could hardly hear the words. I speak severely to my boy, I beat him when he sneezes, for he can thoroughly enjoy the pepper when he pleases. Chorus, wow, wow, wow. Here, you may nurse it a bit if you like, said the Duchess to Alice, flinging the baby at her as she spoke. I must go and get ready to play croquet with the queen. And she hurried out of the room. The cook threw a frying pan after her as she went, but it just missed her. Alice caught the baby with some difficulty, as it was a queer-shaped little creature, and held out its arms and legs in all directions. Just like a starfish, thought Alice. The poor little thing was snorting like a steam engine when she caught it, and kept doubling itself up and straightening itself out again, so that altogether for the first minute or two it was as much as she could do to hold it. As soon as she had made out the proper way of nursing it, which was to twist it up into a sort of a knot and then keep tight hold of its right ear and left foot so as to pre prevent its undoing itself, she carried it out into the open air. If I don't take this child away with me, thought Alice, they're sure to kill it in a day or two. Wouldn't it be murder to leave it behind? She said the last words out loud and the little thing grunted in reply. It had left off sneezing by this time. Don't grunt, said Alice. That's not at all the proper way of expressing yourself. The baby grunted again, and Alice looked very anxiously into its face to see what was the matter with it. There could be no doubt that it had a very turned-up nose, much more like a snout than a real nose. Also, its eyes were getting extremely small for a baby. Altogether, Alice did not like the look of the thing at all. But perhaps it was only sobbing, she thought, and looked into its eyes again to see if there were any tears. No, there were no tears. If you're going to turn into a pig, my dear, said Alice seriously, I'll have nothing more to do with you. Mind now. The poor little thing sobbed again, or grunted, it was impossible to say which, and they went on for some while in silence. Alice was just beginning to think to herself, now what am I to do with this creature when I get at home, when it grunted again so violently that she looked down into its face in some alarm. This time there could be no mistake about it. It was neither more nor less than a pig, and she felt that it would be quite absurd for her to carry it any further. So she set the little creature down and felt quite relieved to see it trot away quietly into the wood. If it had grown up, she said to herself, it would have made a dreadfully ugly child, but it makes a rather handsome pig, I think. And she began thinking over other children she knew who might do very well as pigs and was just saying to herself, if only one knew the right way to change them, when she was a little startled by seeing the Cheshire Cat sitting on a bough of a tree a few yards off. And next time, Alice will converse with the Cheshire Cat. Thank you.